at, at, at John chapter 12, verse 20, it says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with the request, Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said that an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, the voice you heard was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. So what do we do with this passage today? I could, because I find something uh, unusual or surprising in this passage today. Jesus says that his soul is troubled. Troubled. I mean, did Jesus just say that? Yes, Jesus said that. And as I thought about that this week, I realized, hey, you know, regarding, uh, you know, what we're feeling today and what we're going through today, has Jesus ever said anything we identify with more than him saying, my soul is troubled? I mean, Scripture does tell us that one of the advantages, one of the benefits we get from Jesus coming into this world as a human is that he can identify with everything. He can identify with us in every way. And certainly, you know, him being troubled in soul is one way he is identifying with us. He's identifying with us and what it means to be troubled in soul. I mean, especially right now, right? Aren't we troubled in soul by so much of what we're going through, particularly the impacts of this coronavirus and the pandemic? I mean, we're troubled. We're worried about the prospects of people we know, people we love, getting it, becoming sick by it, maybe dying from it. And we're troubled, we're worried that, that we may get it. We worry about those things for ourselves. We worry about our, our economy and, and our income, as many ha have been temporarily put out of work from everything shutting down, or we, we worry about our 401k plans, our retirement plans, our other savings and investments as we see all this just causing the stock market to just plummet, all those things we worked so hard to save for, for the future, we wonder, are they gone? We worry if this life of, uh, is ever going to return to normal or is this, this self-quarantining and this dis distancing and this isolation, is this the new normal now and, and can we get used to that? You know, our souls are troubled by all of this and, and it's everywhere we look. And we just turn on the TV or we look at social media and it's there. The numbers are there every day, right? The number of people who have it, the number of people who have died from it, it's all there and it's very troubling. And that's all beyond all these other issues that we experience in this world that were troubling us beforehand, right? Those troubles are still there. The coronavirus hasn't magically made all those other troubling things go away. So we certainly uh, know what it means to be troubled in soul. And Jesus today he clearly uh, identifies with us when he says, my soul is troubled. But, but I think it's helpful, as, as we look at this text today, helpful to kind of turn things around so not only see that Jesus identifies with us, but maybe we need to go and say, hey, Jesus, how can we identify with you? When we see Jesus saying, my soul is troubled, how can we identify with him? Because when we identify with Jesus when he is troubled, then we, we can identify with the attitude he adopts as he's going through it and the outlook he adopts as he's going through troubled times. And ultimately, we see Jesus' attitude is one of joy. Uh, Jesus' uh, uh, outlook is one of overcoming, it's perseverance, and I think we could all use that right now. We can all use some, some, some tips from Jesus about how, how to get that in our own lives right now. So, so let's look at uh, how Jesus handles things when he is troubled in soul. And so let's start by, by looking at what exactly 
is troubling Jesus at this point because this isn't the type of thing that you would expect Jesus to be saying. We expect Jesus to be out uh, having a good time making uh, water into wine, right? Or, or, or joyfully preaching the kingdom of God come in him or, or telling people how it is that they can come to God in righteousness and how God will make them righteous in faith. But instead today we get him saying, my soul is troubled. You know, it's interesting to note that today's passage, Jesus is in the last week before his crucifixion. Now, next Sunday, it'll be here already, we will celebrate Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before Good Friday. But this, this week, we kind of jump ahead in the timeline a little bit. We're already in the midst of that last week. So uh, Jesus knows crucifixion is coming. And as he gets closer and closer to that event, it seems that he is troubled by the thoughts of it. And it gives voice to that in today's passage. When in verse 23, he tells the people, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, we don't usually uh, use those sorts of terms when we talk about death, right? As someone's going to be glorified. But we do know that Jesus is referring to his upcoming suffering and death here because he goes on in verse 32, the same conversation a little bit later, to say, when I am lifted up from the earth, it's a reference to his crucifixion. And even uh, John, the guy who records this in this gospel for us, he's writing it down, he makes sure we know that Jesus said this in order to indicate the type of death that he would die. So this entire conversation that culminates in Jesus saying, uh, I am troubled in soul, my soul is troubled, it has as its backdrop his upcoming suffering and death. And again, we can kind of identify a little bit with what Jesus is doing here. Uh, we can identify with being troubled by the approach of something we know that's coming that's going to be unpleasant. And because uh, we know, you know, right, we go through things in life and, and we know it's coming, it's going to be unpleasant. And we kind of dwell on it and we're troubled by it. Uh, for some, this might be an upcoming doctor's appointment that, uh, that we don't look forward to. Or it could be a visit to the dentist. What's he going to do in my mouth this time? For, for, for some, it, it could be a surgery that we've been putting off or we, we know is coming and we just aren't looking forward to it. For me, it's that new Disney Channel show that I know is going to come on. My nieces are going to make us watch over and over and over again at home. And they're always vacuous, always morally bankrupt, always just obnoxious, right? No matter what it is, you have your own thing. We want to put all that stuff off as long as possible because we're troubled by the thoughts of those things getting closer and actually having to go through those things in our lives. And that seems to be the case with Jesus, except for where we find Jesus in today's scripture. What's troubling Jesus is the approach of agony and suffering beyond comparing, you know, beyond anything we ever experienced. And, and he, he, is starting to dwell on it so much so that in a few days from now, he, he's going to take three of his closest followers. He's going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to go to pray and he's going to tell them his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Uh, I mean, that's what he says uh, just a little while before uh, his betrayal by Judas and then his arrest. And we all know where things go from there. So that's the backdrop uh, here in today's passage. That's the looming agony. That's what's troubling Jesus here. Uh, very much greater than anything that we experience that causes trouble in our lives. But pay attention, not only to what's troubling Jesus here, but I, I think we need to pay attention to Jesus' response to his soul being troubled. I mean, let me read to you the fuller statement of Jesus, starting at verse 27. Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. See, Jesus knows that his Father in heaven has a plan. And he indicates that the Father's plan is for him to suffer in his upcoming death. According to God's plan, Jesus came for the purpose of suffering. And Jesus knows that. So even though he's troubled by the thought of going through it, he's not going to deny it. He, he's not going to turn away from it. Instead, he declares, Father, glorify your name. God, be glorified in my following you, even through this thing that's just troubling me so much. Even in the midst of living out the things that trouble him, Jesus' first concern is that God is glorified. His first concern isn't for himself. His first concern is for God's glory. 
which is amazing. That's why he says in verse 23 that the time has come for the son uh, 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 to be glorified. You know, in his death, there's glory. God is glorified. And when we look at that, we say, well, how could God be glorified in his son being put to death in such a horrible, horrific manner? And we, of course, we know in the church, we know the answer, the big answer to that. But we look to today's text and it's got some answers for us too. Verse 31, something I think we over, often overlook when we look at how God is glorified in the crucifixion of Jesus. But Jesus said in his suffering, the prince of this world, that's the devil, will be driven out. You know, that devil who was the one who tempted Adam and Eve to commit that first sin, and he's tempted every single one of us ever since to go out and sin and rebel against God and be disobedient. And so in our sin, this world has become a corrupt place where, where we have horrible diseases and awful things happen. You know, that devil, he's going to be driven out. He's going to be defeated. He's going to be driven out of the hearts of man by Jesus. That's glorifying to God. But the big answer, the big way God is glorified, Jesus gets at in verse 32, that when, when he declares that when he is lifted up on the cross, he will draw all people to himself. See, when Jesus is crucified, he is drawing everyone to himself. He's going to draw everyone to God. In his suffering on the cross, Jesus draws all people to him. He's drawing all people to come to him for the forgiveness of their sins, forgiveness for the rebellion, all paid for by his death on the cross. He's drawing all people to eternal life in God's glory, to eternal life in God's paradise. Now the thought of suffering may be troubling to Jesus ahead of time, but he knows that he will carry out the action and in that he knows that he's going to be drawing all people to him. He draws all people to him. That's you and me. Jesus draws us to him. That's everyone in the church all over the world today who claims Jesus Christ. Jesus is drawing them to him. But you know who else Jesus draws to him? That annoying coworker. Many of you right now might, might not be going to work and you're glad because you don't have to face that coworker, right? It's that, that nosy neighbor. It's that guy you always see out in the street walking down the sidewalk and you just know he's selling drugs. And I don't know. Maybe he is. But Jesus died to draw all of them to him. You know, I was in Aldi Monday. It was the only place I went all week because I really don't want to get this thing. And being a lifelong asthmatic, I don't want it. Uh, so I, I, the plan was to get into Aldi, get my food, get out, and get home. Right? And so that's what I did. I went in, got, got the stuff in, in my shopping cart, and I was uh, checking out. And the cashier w was uh, moving me through. And then behind me comes another customer, a man who must have been 60, 70 years old. And he only had a couple few things in his hands, didn't even have a cart. Uh, and so the cashier, very kind. Uh, spoke to him and said, sir, you see this yellow line back there? Do you please want to uh, step behind that so we can practice social distancing the way we've been asked to in our culture right now? And man, this guy just got really mean and nasty with her and, and just started arguing with her and blaming all these things on her and just acting like it was the most uh, insane thing that she would ask him to step back a few feet. And, and as uh, she was uh, discussing this with this man, I was standing there thinking, man, I'm glad she's the cashier right now and not me because she was so calm and, and gentle and polite to this man and I would have just gone off on him right? Because, you know, patience isn't my thing. And I was just like standing there thinking, dude, if you didn't want to follow the rules of the store, why didn't you go shopping somewhere else? You know, you know, all the other stores, it's the only place that are still open, but they're still open. You can go there. I mean, this guy was, was so mean and nasty. He could play Ebenezer Scrooge without doing any acting. I mean, that's how he came off. But guess what? Jesus died to draw that man to himself. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross. He was drawing all people in and that God's glorified. Now, the thought of what he was going to have to go through in order to do that is troubling to Jesus ahead of time. But we know he does go and he does it in order to draw all people to him. See, Jesus offers salvation to all people. Now, to be clear here, it's up to each individual to decide whether they want to accept his salvation, whether they want to in turn draw close to Jesus when he draws them in. 
And as I thought about it this week, it kind of reminded me of, of the fish at the Linesville Spillway in Pima Tuming State Park. Most of you, many of you have been there, but for those of you who haven't, let, let me cue you in on what it is. It's on Lake Pima Tuming, right? And there's a place where the road kind of bisects the lake. And so there's a bridge over it. And right, right at that bridge, it seems like the lake kind of um, switches levels there. So right at the bridge, there's a man-made kind of horseshoe drop off right around the bridge where the, the water spills over in order to change levels there. Well, uh, for whatever reason, thousands and thousands of these giant fish, these carp, or they carps, I don't know what the plural is, uh, but they, they like to gather there. And so the touristy thing to do is, is to go, and there's a place there where you can buy old, stale, moldy bread, whatever, and you can break it apart and throw it into the water, and the fish just clobber each other just to, to get the, that, that piece of bread. It's like they're fighting over it. It's insane. And uh, it's like they're all starving, but you know by the size of them, they're not, right? But the fun thing my sisters and I always liked to do when we went there, even as kids, and I'll admit, you know, we still do it when we're there. You know, we, we like to throw the bread down at the very top, at the very edge of where the water is spilling over to try to get the fish to go after that bread and be washed down over the spillway. We think it's great, but it doesn't happen very often at all. In fact, most times when we're there, we can't even get one fish because they're smart and they know, they know that point of no return. They can, they can follow that bread to snatch it up to this point, but not any further, right? Uh, and for whatever reason, the fish choose not to be drawn down over that spillway. It's pulling them down, but they choose to go the other way and they fight against it. They work very hard not to go down over that spillway. People are the same way. People draws, uh, Jesus draws all people to him. But some, sadly, many, choose not to go to him. They choose not to be drawn by him. But we see God is glorified by the salvation of the, all those who allow Jesus to draw them into it. He is glorified by Jesus willingly giving his life on the cross to make it possible. Sure, while Jesus was facing the challenge, he's looking at it ahead of time, Jesus may have been troubled by the difficulty he was facing. But he did it anyway. Because it was all God's plan. He did it under the glory of God. See, Jesus knew the plan, and he willingly went through the troubled times to accomplish it. That was his attitude. That was his outlook. I'm going to go through it for God, and I'm going to do it. And that same Jesus says in verse 26 today, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be also. Meaning that if we follow Jesus, if we claim to be these people who are drawn to him, and we draw near to him for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. If we follow Jesus, we will be serving in the same place he is serving. Now, there are many implications to what Jesus is saying here in this passage today, and we just don't have enough time to delve into all of them. But one of them I think we overlook is that if Jesus is serving in obedience to God for the purpose of God's glory in the midst of trouble, then we will be with him serving God in obedience for his glory when we are troubled. You see, not only physically will we be in the same place as Jesus, but emotionally, mentally, by our attitude and actions, we will be in the same place. When our souls are troubled, we must follow Jesus and be willing to serve God even in the midst of it, be willing to look to God's glory even as we face these troubles. Our response should be, what did Jesus say? He said, Father, glorify your name. It should be, God, as I go through this, be glorified. Be glorified in me, God, in my reaction, in my response, in my confident going forward in your plan, even though I don't know what the plan is. God, be glorified. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't ask God to take away those things that trouble us. I mean, that's kind of what we see Jesus saying he's not going to do in verse 27. He says he's not going to ask God to take away what is troubling him, in this case, his upcoming death and suffering, because Jesus knows the purpose. Jesus knows the plan. You see, we're people. We don't know the plan. We don't know all of God's purposes. Instead, we are called to follow God in faith. And so often we see it as a bad thing. Oh, if I just knew God's plan, if I just knew the purpose behind it, I'd be better, right? Isn't that what we think? But at the same time, not knowing the plan, not knowing the purpose kind of gives us an out. 
So we should always feel free. We should always be comfortable. We should always be looking to come before God and ask him to take away those things that are troubling us. Because we don't know the plan and purpose, and maybe taking them away is his plan and purpose. So as we go through this pandemic, as we face it as a nation of people, as a world of people, keep praying to God to take it away. Pray that those who have it will be healed. Pray that the medical personnel are kept safe and healthy and are given wisdom and compassion and perseverance. Pray that they have what they need in order to take care of people. Pray that this doesn't spread to anybody else. Pray that an effective a treatment and a vaccination can be found as soon as possible right now. Pray that those facing financial or emotional difficulties during this time are cared for. See, unless God has made some other purpose and plan known to you, and he probably hasn't, so unless he has, join your brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world in praying for these things to be taken away. Pray for the trouble to be taken away. But, there's a big but. We like big buts, don't we? But here's the thing. First and foremost, beyond all that, before all that, follow Jesus by seeking God's glory even as your soul is troubled by these things. In these troubled times, call out to God that he be glorified. As God told Jesus in today's passage, he has been glorified and he will be glorified in the future. God's going to do it. God, be glorified. As we face the troubles in this world today, not the least is this coronavirus pandemic. May we look to God and may we beg him, God, how can I glorify you as I face this trouble today? And if we're honest, most of us have to say that's not really been part of our prayers a whole lot. When we face any trouble, let alone what we've been going through these past few weeks. You know, if we, if we are going through something troubling and we ask God to be glorified in it, often, if it's even on the list, it's toward the bottom. But here it is. Even in this, dear Lord, be glorified in me and through me. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what it is to serve Jesus, to seek God's glory. And Jesus promises us in verse 26 of, of today's scripture lesson that the Father in heaven will honor those who serve Jesus. See, we will be honored when we are seeking to glorify God in the midst of the things that are troubling us today. So often we miss out on God honoring us and giving us things because we're not putting him first. We're not looking to his glory first. I know for many of us it's, it's troubling to say during your troubled times, look to God's glory. Stop thinking about yourself. And, and so many, maybe some people out there listening to me today are, are at the point where you're like, I'm not ready to do that. I'm not ready to give everything over to God's glory. And maybe for at least for some of you, it's because you're still living your life for yourself. You, you haven't decided to follow Jesus yet. But as Jesus said in today's text, he draws everyone to him. His offer of salvation and peace with God and relationship with God is extended to each and every person. I don't care who you are, what you've done. Jesus draws you to him today. <clears throat> All you have to do is follow him. And as he explained in today's text, what does it mean to follow him? It means you hate your life. You hate this life that you've been living that's been all about yourself, all about what you want and what you're going to do and what you think. You turn your back on that old life. And instead, you turn and embrace the new life in Jesus Christ that he's offering you. Jesus says, if you love your life in this earth, you will lose it. But if you hate it, you will gain it for all eternity. That's what he says in today's text. Stop living for yourself and start living for Jesus, living for God's glory, you see. And you too will be saved to the glory of God. You see, it's all for the glory of God. Whatever you face today, brothers and sisters, won't you make that, that decision today to follow Jesus, to turn back to following Jesus, that we might seek ways to glorify God even as we face these things? Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we 
do thank you so much for giving us your son, Jesus Christ, as uh, he is our strength, he is our rock, he is our purpose as we face uncertain things in society today. God, we thank you that through it all you were there, and we thank, it, thank you that you bring your glory into the darkest, most troublesome places, and that you promise uh, that even as you have glorified yourself in the past, even through this, you will glorify yourself again. God, help us to be those people who confidently go through the things that trouble us in our souls, seeking uh, not only to be relieved of trouble, but also, God, to bring glory to you as we face the trouble. May we always be looking to you and seeking you and seeking your glory. And we pray it all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.